So, uh, my uh, lecture, second lecture, is on on constraints. Uh, it, so, I, as we know, to use uh, the functionals, one has to derive constraints and then get the functionals to approximate the constraints as best as possible. The title is on constraints for approximating f of n. And uh, I said, please keep uh, from John Perdue's talk, says the underlying exact theory shapes the approximations in two ways. And this is what I like to continue to emphasize and say is we have an existence theorem. An existence theorem gives one confidence and says, hey, we should work for something that exists. And the exact properties are used uh, to get EXC. And, and if you're approximating kinetic without orbitals, that is a, a way to do it from the definition of the exact function. So this is the approach. The approach is always definition, definition, definition to understand the definition of what exists and then to approximate the definition. So along those lines, let's remind what we did this morning. Uh, e ground state is the this minimum here, f of n is this constrained minimization here, and this paper was published here. Uh, and the minimizing psi that yields n is called psi n here, and we define f of n this way here. So right now I'm going to put down the definitions again, and from the definitions we can see some of the properties right away. So, so, and of course we had TS of N as the common sham kinetic, and that's equal to min, okay, uh, it's a minimum of uh, phi yield N, right? Uh, phi t, just the t, I'll bring it up phi. Okay. I use a different symbol then to psi, but it's the same thing for all wave functions, but I will use phi. It doesn't matter. And then this minimizing phi we'll call phi n. T by n, and it, it turns out to be almost always a single determinant. In fact, if the non-interacting system is non-degenerate, it is a single determinant. So it's almost always. In the case of the determinant doesn't exist, uh, and uh, well, we went through this uh, convex sum of degenerate ground states. You don't get a single determinant, but you you almost always get a single term. So we can think of this as a single term. Think of this as the function. Okay. So here you're minimizing just the kinetic and that. And Thomas firmly tries to approximate this. So with this phi n, the exchange, Exn, is equal to phi n. VE by N minus UN. Minus UN. Okay, so 
The UN is the classical impulsion. It's a different than the UN in New York. It's a classical impulsion. It's a one half. And R1 and R2. R1 minus R2. D3 R1. D3 R2. Okay. So that's that right now. Uh, so I have exchange in U. So uh, exchange is B minus U, this is U here. And correlation, E correlation, now we continue, E correlation N is equal to uh, psi N T plus B, the full T plus B, and this is the psi n from here, minimizing psi T plus B, psi n, so F, psi n, minus what? What do I subtract from here? Phi. Phi, yeah, the same thing with the phi, the cone chaff. Okay, so phi n, which is indicate that this phi n is cone chaff. So this is the same thing with the fire. Okay. So you see okay, I'm trying to try to use these two boards. That's okay. Uh it's what we know. Okay. Now uh all right, so um, okay. we also have uh, well, that, that is far as I call it a T of call that kinetic uh okay, go this way. Here. We need two more. We need the kinetic contribution to the correlation energy. This is what Karen talked about today. Uh, let's let's do it this way. Uh, we'll, we'll write it this way instead. That ECN is equal to TCN plus oh PCN. I'll call it UCN. I think that's what Karen called it, right? UCN. This is a U. I call it a V, but I call it U. It's what Karen did to make a U. A U C. That's the University of California. That's the University of California. And she had an I here for everybody, right? Okay, so we have that. ECN is. Now, what is TCN? And then contributions in the correlation. Uh, TCN is what? Tell me what it is. What is the kinetic contribution to the correlation? Someone give it to me. Psi of t minus um, bracket of phi of t. Correct. Right. Right. It's the one that minimizes t plus v e total psi n minus one which is called chap. So it's psi n, right, it's psi n, t, Psi n minus the cone chap phi n t phi n okay. and what is its sign? What's the sign of T C? Positive because phi minimizes this t, right? And phi and minimizes the sum. So it's greater than zero. And actually, Kara gave numbers this morning. He said this is 0.33, right? It was for neon. Remember, it was 0.33. 
I have the numbers here. We're going to try to understand the numbers by next time. Right? I'll start moving through it. And then the UCN is equal to uh, psi n. And then it would just be VE, right? No? Psi n. Minus psi n. Okay, and what is the sign of this? Negative. Why is it negative? Why is it negative? Because what? Because what? Why is it negative? No, B is a positive operator. Yeah, but well, okay, but look, what is what is the sign of ECM, the sum of the two? This minimizes psi t plus b psi, right? So this is negative. The sum is negative, and if the t part is positive, the b positive. Okay, good. Well, good and in fact, okay, this is about twice this. We can understand that, but uh, so far, that's what we have. Okay, now. Uh, you can just say uh, sign is, the, is <coughs> the function that minimizes uh, for all this. Both yeah. are <coughs> So uh, that's what we have. And of course, the sum, uh, the sum must be negative. <laughs> Why is okay now? Let's uh, uh, examples of constraints. Now, when I am talking about constraints, so through the other lectures, people will be mentioning constraints and the examples and what is being satisfied and how the uh, function will get better, such as future future lectures of. John Whitehall and others. So uh, we'll we'll just see constraints, but just I'll give you examples right off the bat. Uh, so we uh, we had uh, the components, let's say components of. Say, say we have EXN and ECN. This is examples of constraints, right? Examples of constraints. They, they should uh, give correctly the uniform uh, homogeneous electron gas, right? Yeah. So they should be correct. These are examples of constraints to approximate that. So EX and her should be made approximations to it. So uh, satisfies correct values for when density is uniform. And uh, okay. now when you you take an approximate functional and make it obey and, and just use the uniform but you get when you get a uniform electron density, that's the local density approximation, of course, that John described in the John Purdue described in detail this morning. So when I talk about TS, we where TS also, and the TS uniform situation is the Thomas Burmese, and we have EX and E C is what we are primarily concerned with then. And mostly you see a combination of EX and C. So these are examples, okay? 
Uh, and they are also correct for slowly varying densities, second order, fourth order, etc. Uh, these are some examples. And I will concentrate on coordinate scaling uh, for most of my lecture here. But first of all, these functionals that are successful uh, right off the bat have EXN, EX as negative, but also you see that EC and must be less than zero, correct? Because this is the definition, right? This minimizes T plus V E, and this minimizes just T, but we're taking the expectation value of T plus V. So the cone jam minimizes just T, but the expectation value is zero. So this is it. So you see just from the definition, and get this, and you see how powerful, how powerful the definitions are to get you to get the constraints back here. So what's another constraint we see right off the bat? That's ECN is equal to zero or one electron. For one electron. Why is that? Well, let's look at EC again. For one electron, this is missing, right? And now this, if this is missing, this, minim this minimizes just the expectation value with respect to T. It does the same thing here. So it's zero. Okay, right over there. Okay, you have also other constraints like uh, we need oxygen down. Uh, and the others that I'll talk about. But I want to start getting into right now coordinate scaling constraints. And um, so uh, I'll talk today about the constraints of the EX, okay, from coordinate scaling. Right off the bat. So I can erase this and let's concentrate on EX right now. So we'll just look at EX and constraint EX using coordinate scaling. So here is EX here. I'll erase this. So here's what you have here. And we're going to now concentrate on, on EX. Okay. But please keep in mind the other lectures, I'll use this notation. So before I give the other lectures, I'm going to be giving, giving my research lecture will be a continuation of these, these kinds of lectures. So I'm going to continue with the pedagogical lectures for the research. All right, so we have EX with this, and now let's, let me erase this here, and uh, I'm going to look at uh, so we're going to now try to be well I understand EX uh, so we're understanding the structure Part of the structure, really, uh, or part of the understanding, and the structure of the X 
group coordinate scaling. I'm going to talk about this for two lectures more. I need a connection to take two more lectures uh, beyond this. Okay. So understanding structure of the S group coordinate scaling. So, okay, so uh, now, what is what is the definition of a uniformly scaled density? Is when I, I scale all the coordinates, I take a density, an arbitrary density, and I scale all the coordinates by gamma. This is understanding the functional or dimensional aspects of function. So you understand the structure, you derive this coordinate scaling properties, and then you, you get approximations to satisfy the properties and other properties. So we have this here, and then this is gamma cubed. So this is an arbitrary density times the original density. And uh, here, okay. uh, gamma x, gamma y, gamma z. Okay. So this is the scale density. So you're starting off with simply the arbitrary density n x x y z. Okay. And you're forming a scale density here. Right? And this integrates to n electrons. If this gives n electrons. And so it does this because of the gamma cube. So let's go through where we're doing three dimensional integrations and n gamma x, y, z, uh, dx, y, z is equal to the integral of n gamma x, gamma y, gamma z, and it's d gamma x, gamma y, gamma z. Okay, so, and this is really three integrals, of course, and you get from minus infinity to plus infinity. The key point is, so we, you, you multiply by gamma cubed to keep the norm as n electrons because, as I mentioned in my first talk, I'm doing a lot of things with the use of the word dummy. So it's a dummy variables, you see, so this is like an x prime. And what's beautiful about minus infinity and plus infinity is when you change these variables, you still maintain minus infinity and plus infinity. So where you're originally going from x, x, y, z integration, you're now doing gamma x, gamma y, gamma z. So if the original one integrates then, this integrates then. Okay, so we maintain the normalization. All right, so now that's understanding the structure. We start off with this. And uh, the, uh, so we're going to focus on this today. But I'll just put down a few key uniform coordinate scaling relations. Am I too far? Oh, I'm not too far here, right? We're ready. I'm closer to you. Okay, okay. I don't see very well, so I, I don't know what, what people are seeing. So if you... <laughs> he, uh, so this is... The, okay, I'll just call it scaling. Constraints. Okay. 
then uh, so what we have is that uh, for for TS the whole TS we have n gamma equal gamma squared TSN and then for U, of course, this doesn't have to be approximated. U and gamma is equal to gamma UN. And then EX, and this is what we're going to derive today, N gamma equal gamma EXN. And then uh, EC and gamma has an inequality. And that's gamma squared TCN. We put that down before. Plus gamma V UCN. You see your line N. Okay? Okay. U. This is a U. U C. Alright, so these are the scaling relations. And we're going to derive this today, and we'll talk about this tomorrow. Okay, now, why the squared here? Okay, the gamma squared comes from the fact that the kinetic operator has a second derivative. Right? Okay. Why gamma here? One power is because, and this involves just the repulsion operator, because you're doing 1 over ri to the minus rj, absolute value, right, uh, to the 1 power, right? Did you write out what you're saying? I will, okay? You'll see it, it more explicitly, okay? Okay, I'll do that. Okay, so we're going to have... Uh, okay, this is... There's a... Uh, so for for T S yes please just, just put that you put that out right okay for T S uh, we'll say gamma squared arises from fact that operator involves a second derivative. As I said, I'm giving you two more lectures. I'll give these a greater detail. All right? That's a, for TS. For, for U and now, as I'm going through it, I'm not going through it slowly, but the object is to get functionals to satisfy these. Good one will do. Uh, so, for U and EX, we have the gamma arises from the fact that uh, operator involves R I minus R J right to the negative one power. So it's, it's gamma to the one, right? Negative one power. And there's something else. Right? And 
There is only one operator involved in the constrained search. You see, these both have EX and TS. Okay, drives in fact the operator involved or okay, that, that's that's fine. Let's just leave it at that. Now the inequality in EC. Maybe I'll just talk slowly at this point, okay? And all right, but better talk slowly is better writing it out. I think. No, I meant the equations. I didn't mean like write the words you're saying. Okay. Oh, I am going to go through the equation. I'm going to show how you get it. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. I'm going to do that. Okay. But that's what I'm going to get to. But first, I. I I will show you what we have, all right? So, the gamma square rises from the operators that rises from back there, from back that operator, well, so this is just the kinetic, okay? So the kinetic operator involves the second derivative. The u in x gamma rises from the fact that we involves r d to the negative one power. Right, that's good too. Now, this inequality arises from the fact that you have both a kinetic part, so gamma squared, just like the gamma here, and a potential energy part, the gamma. But since you have mixed operators, kinetic, and potential, it's, things get a little more complicated and you get it in equality. Okay, so now let's, let's uh, we'll give some more properties, but let's, let's now show how we get things out, okay? So let's, let's first, let's do EX, okay? You can see, as I said, we'll concentrate on EX. So let's go over here. How much time do I have for the regular? Ten minutes. Ten minutes for the regular. Okay, good. Nice start. So again, what we're going to do is we'll be able to derive this today, and then I'll just show an example where it is it satisfies. And we'll we'll go on in two more lectures after this. I'll, I'll continue with it. Okay, so now let's, let's, in order to get EX, it show this is the case. Remember, EX involves a U. So let's do U first. Uh, U and gamma, right, is equal to So it's one half, right? So now, you know, what we did is we put the two integrals here. It's really six dimensional integral, and so we have here. Uh, remember, this is gamma to the third. So what we have is n, and I'll, I'll write it as gamma r. I mean gamma x, y, z. Okay, it's a shorthand way of doing it. So here's the scale density is put in here. And this is R1, and then N gamma R2. Okay. Alright, that's what we have. And then remember we had the gamma cubed here. So we're putting it out here. Gamma R cubed one and uh, D gamma R two cubed. Okay. Right, that's the scale density here, okay? And we have from the prefactors we put it in here, and that is uh, now we have the 
R1 minus R2. Okay. Okay. So how does this get? You have in both the terms here, you have the gamma multiplying them out. So what do we do? Uh, let's write it this way. We're going to go, let's put in a gamma here, all right? Okay? And put in the gamma here, right? Okay? And then we put in a gamma here and a gamma here, and then we'll put a gamma out here, right? Because what do these gammas do? They just factor out, okay? Since the gamma factors out, it crosses out this, yeah? Okay. Now, what is gamma R1, gamma R2, gamma R1, what kind of variables? The dummy variables of integration, right? I said we're going to use a lot of dummies. Yes? Where'd you get the gamma on the outside of the I put it outside to cancel this one. On purpose? Yeah, on purpose. I did it, yeah. Right. Sounds good, right? I've been allowed to do it. Because this, it wasn't here to begin with, right? Should I write it down in two steps? Okay. So originally, I didn't have it here. So I stuck it in here, stuck it in here, put it out here, okay? But now I'm integrating over this. This trip would do a lot, right? And this is the same as the original one. So u and gamma is equal to, uh, well, if it's equal to gamma, times one half what we had originally. N R one N R two R one minus R two D three R one D three R two, right? And therefore we have N N gamma is equal to gamma U N. Okay? Sound good? Does everyone agree with this? Okay. So, well, we could do the same thing with the wave function. All right? Do I have to go through or it seems fine? Do the same trick. You put the you put the gammas in the wave function, right? No? Is there, how many want me to do the gammas through the wave in the wave function? How many don't want me to do it? Yeah. Oh, but no, you well, most people don't want me to do it. <laughs> so, what? Oh, this one here. Yeah. All right, you involved in this one. So, all right. Do you do you see this? I see that you put the gamma on the bottom, so then you put the gamma on the top. Right, the but gamma R one, that's that's the same thing as an R one prime. You know what I mean? It, it's it's just a change of variables, and we're going from minus to infinity. But so all these gammas operate as R1 prime, R2 prime, R1 prime, R2 prime, R1 prime, R1 prime. So it gives us, it's the same thing as, you're just calling it something different. So you see? end up with the situation of x equals gamma x, essentially. Right, right. Okay. okay? So it's good. This is a trick we're using here. And it's easy to do because you're going from minus infinity to plus infinity. You see, so there's no change in the limit. Yes? Can you please show instead the inequality and get better at where it arises from? Because uh, it seems to me that you said it arises from the fact that you have the different... Yeah, I'm getting to that, but I, I'll, I'll get next time. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, that's that's very exciting. The inequality is very exciting. <laughs> so what do you think about it? Yeah. Sorry to jump, but it seems like we sort of skipped it with the kinetic energy thing with the second derivative. But you can read it to the second derivative of gamma cubed. Yeah, well, you have to use the chain rule. You yeah. can do the chain. So then you have the gamma from the from the. Yeah. Then the I could write it. I'll try to. I'll write it out. I'll do next. I'll write it out to you on a piece of paper. Did the gamma cubed from front disappear? We got rid of it. It's, it's the same kind of trick, except using a chain rule. Take my work. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, but I, I went through this, and so this is what we have. Okay, so now, so that's, so that's what you have for the U, and it, it's going to be the same for when we scale the wave function. So we get this, 
You see, if you do it in both parts, okay, the EX is this. So this has the scaling, right? Okay. So we scale away from P here. So uh, okay, so what happens here, where is the thing? Is that uh I'll just put down here. So what we get then is EX and gamma is equal to and then we scale the weight function by and I'm come from the scale of the weight function here. Okay. And it so happens it's you but the bits, it just sit, it's a simple way of scaling the weight function here. So uh, I'll just well, it's a little more, I'll just I'll just scale this. Okay, just say scale, and then B E E, and then by N, and we do the same scale. There's a reason I'm not putting N lambda down, lambda down here. This is scale. And then it's minus the u and gamma. And uh, so that's equal to gamma EXS. In other words, I, I didn't put the scale factors in here. Or right, let me put it this way. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm sorry, I'll do it this way. I'll go and gamma and gamma. And here you just have to scale the wave function. So an ADEX. Okay. Right now, so we have that. Now I'll give it a simple example of of uh, of the LDA approximation here. I'll just end it here. Is that okay? You're forty five minutes. Right. So this will take five minutes, but it's a nice ending, okay? So uh, finish. Now, so this has this scaling, and now we'll give an example how we derive a constraint. So we have wave functions in the definition, and remember, definition, 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 and gives us this, and we'll see how this arises to an understanding of functional form. So I'll give a very simple example. It's a kind of a nice way to end it. Okay, so we'll do it this way now. And this is this way I would like to end these steps. Okay, so uh okay. So uh So this is the understanding of the structure. So consider the LDA approximation for EX. Is, and what it is is EX LDA is equal to minus a constant times the integral of N to the four thirds R. Did you all see this? Okay. Should I use a different pen? No. It's okay. okay. You can use maybe the blue. Yeah. That's getting better. N to the four thirds. Let uh, me just put it here. N to the four thirds R D three R. Okay. Now we show 
that empower has to be four thirds. Power has to be four thirds so that dx LDA and gamma is equal to gamma dx LDA. So we're going to show that now. So let's just do that, all right? So we have the integral of n gamma to the four thirds r d3 r okay, is equal to the row gamma q. Remember the definitions of the scale density n gamma x gamma y gamma z to the four thirds, right? And then it's uh, dx dy dz. I can write out dr, but I'll do it this way. Okay? That's that's what it is, right? And that's now to the fourth power. So that's equal now gamma to the fourth. Right? Uh, that is an integral. Right? Integral gamma to the fourth and gamma x, gamma y, gamma z. And uh, there's a gamma to the fourth here, and this goes to the four thirds. And dx, dy, dz. And then you have gamma, right? And the integral of n gamma x, gamma y, gamma z to the four thirds. And then it's d gamma x. D, gamma y, D, gamma z, right? But what is this? It's the same trick, right? Do you see that? What I did I put gamma x, gamma y, gamma z, gamma x, gamma y, gamma z. Did you see that? Yeah? All right, so what is this equal to? The original one, right? So that's equal to, put it up here, Okay, so that's equal to gamma, right? Times our original integral. So this is equal to gamma times n x y z to the four thirds dx dy dz. And it's equal to, uh, that's what it is, it's four thirds of the original. So it's equal to gamma, I would have it out, the integral of n of r to the four thirds d3 r. All right? So that happens. So any other power, you see, any other power than four thirds would be wrong. All right, so we have a homework assignment. What's the homework assignment? Show that the correct, well, okay, given that TS goes as gamma squared, all right, show that the Thomas Fermi integral to n to the 5 thirds, it has to be 5 thirds. Okay? That's the homework. You have to get the homework to be under my door at 745. All right? Do the kinetic. So gamma squared part C is for that one. All right, so that's it. So uh, this virtually every function you have take seriously has this, 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 this expression. 
correlation is another matter, and it, it, it's more complicated. John Perdue and I, in 1985, discovered some some really nice surprises with with with, with each city with inequality. So I'll talk about it. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>
Does the land function scale the same way as the data state? It does if the wave function is 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 defined as a constraint minimization of one operator. But when you have two operators and you have each sign n, it's two operators, then it's a different ball game. Okay? And I'll I'll bring it up next time. Other questions? Well, if not, then I'll ask the question for the benefit of the students. So you showed some of and you proved some of the scaling relations here. Maybe you want to share with the students uh, a little bit of intuition of why this is such an important constraint uh, to maintain when you're constructing an approximate density function. It's obviously an exact property, but what makes it so essential to functional construction? Well, I mean, let's let's give this as an example. Okay, say, okay, we 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 derive this exchange from the uniform electron gas, etc., the, the plane waves, etc. But say we didn't do it. This is simply an example. Right, I'm just giving a simple example. I'm saying this is how we do things. Right, how we how we derive things and how we use it. So I gave a, a very simple example. But let's assume we didn't know what was wrong with this. By the way, I appreciate the question. So we didn't know the form of this. So we're we're putting here uh, an M. Say we want we don't know. Right? So we just we just put in an M here. We put in an M. So we don't know. Okay. So it's important because we we derive this, but we don't know what n is. So it's important because to satisfy this, you get m must be four thirds. So it's important getting the structure of the function. Was there any function that were derived using this way of stacking, and not only proved or? Oh yeah. Well, the the the. the the uh, the GGAs and uh, all the others, uh, you you end up projecting out an exchange that has this this quality. I mean, uh, I I derive constraints and other jars, etc. Uh, and others uh, derive constraints but functional themselves. So is this correct? What did I say, John? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So John, it's interesting. Down. I think that the you know, <coughs> LBA was originally constructed. It was only based on the uniform gas, and yet it satisfies all the statements. That's right. right. That's so very interesting. Thing. Later. Right, right, right. So yeah, you were talking earlier about the LBA, right? In terms of the whole. Well, here's a case that it satisfies the step. In fact, when you find out in '85, the correlation was satisfying all the inequality, a lot of inequality problems too. Right, so this is kind of, I, I don't, I'm not involved in the construction of the function, but in deriving constraints. And, and uh, I, there's, not, there's not a function that has been developed in the last 30 years that doesn't have this satisfying. Oh, 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 Minnesota. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Minnesota. Uh, Don Trigger in Minnesota. Well, oh, right, that's another philosophy. You see, what he does there is he, he just puts parameters in the functional and it has a fit empirical data. And that's right, these, these are unsatisfied. And what happens is the functionals could fall unexpectedly, you know, at, at times because they don't satisfy these constraints and they do well at other times. But uh, uh, yes, I, I meant the functionals that use constraints. Uh, well, well, this is a, a very, very standard one to use. Uh, uh, but the, the interesting point about it, there are these functional that you just play with parameters and you satisfy empirical conditions you get from wave function calculations, etc. Okay, so that you have 
well, a large number of these, but what happens with these constraints, this simple constraint is, is means an infinite number of density satisfy this. So it, it's much more powerful, I think. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through and give you additional field for the derivation involving correlation and we'll, we'll look further at it. So it, it, it's important to know some of these constraints, but what's more important to know is the philosophy behind how constraints are derived. So what I'm simply giving you are examples and also the idea that these constraints are very powerful for getting the approximate function. All right, let's thank now once again.